Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for this Lunch and Learn webinar. We're so glad that you're here and grateful to this panel of experts who will provide their perspectives and address common misconceptions about clinical trials, a very important component of rare cancer care. This is the second of a series of three webinars that will focus on different aspects of clinical trials and precision medicine for patients with rare cancers. The next webinar will take place in December, so please watch our website and social media for more information. I'm Kristen Palma, the president of Target Cancer Foundation. My late husband, Paul Poth, founded Target Cancer Foundation when he was diagnosed with a rare cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, in 2007. He was only 38 years old and a new dad and was shocked to learn that for someone so young and healthy, living in Boston with the best research and medical minds, that there was no treatment meant for his disease and little research being done to find a treatment just because it was rare. He started Target Cancer Foundation to change this. And almost 15 years later, we have given over $2 million in research grants, including over $1 million for research into cholangiocarcinoma, a disease that now has multiple identified actionable targets that have led to treatments, exactly what Paul had hoped for. At the time he was diagnosed, there were no clinical trials meant specifically for his disease. It's hard for me to remember the many, many times that Paul had to change treatment courses because the treatments that were given to him designed for other cancers were not working. I also remember when his doctor suggested that we consider a clinical trial and how upset we both were to hear this because to us, this meant that his doctor was giving up on Paul and that he was trying a last resort. We really had no understanding of what clinical trials were or why they could be such an important tool in a cancer like his. We hear this fear about clinical trials from patients frequently, which is why we are here today. And we are so grateful to have two leaders in the field, Dr. Cleary and Dr. Ellis, who are treating patients with rare cancers every day and offering personalized treatment and often clinical trials to inform their care. The importance of clinical trials for rare cancers also led us to our most exciting initiative in 2020, when Target Cancer Foundation designed an operationalized TCF-001 track, a first of its kind precision medicine clinical trial that is enrolling 400 patients with rare cancers. This trial allows patients to consent remotely from their homes with no requirement to travel. Once enrolled, we facilitate genomic testing of blood and tissue at no cost through our partnership with Foundation Medicine. A team of rare cancer experts who comprise our virtual molecular tumor board then review the results and provide personalized treatment recommendations. We have already enrolled over 160 patients from 41 states with over 40 different rare cancers and are so proud to lead this important work. Now, I'm honored to introduce our moderator, Mary Pat Lancelotta. Mary Pat has been a board member at Target Cancer Foundation for over six years and was one of our earliest guides in developing the track study. Mary Pat is a Vice President of Corporate Marketing and Communications at Adaptive Biotechnologies. She is a seasoned healthcare strategist with a passion for precision medicine, and she brings over 20 years of business and strategy experience. We are so grateful to have her leadership on our board and thank her for leading this very important conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Pat. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kristen, for that introduction. And I just wanna welcome uh, everybody here today and thank Kristen and Jim and Target Cancer Foundation for hosting a webinar on this extremely important topic. Uh, I am joined today, as Kristen mentioned, by Dr. James Cleary. Uh, James, uh, Dr. Cleary is the co-director of clinical trials at the Center for Gastrointestinal Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, he's also the Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm also joined by Dr. Haley Ellis, the Physician Scientist and Chief Oncology Fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, I wanna hand it over to the two of them to introduce themselves uh, and give a bit about their background um, and particularly their experience and uh, unique expertise on this, pro on this uh, topic before diving into some of the questions for today. Uh, so first, Dr. Cleary. First, I want to thank Target Cancer for organizing this event. It's really a wonderful forum for patients to hear more about clinical trials. I, I, I've worked in clinical trials my entire career. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time doing what we'll talk about is early phase clinical trials. 
And now my focus is mainly in pancreas and cholangeal carcinoma, um, developing clinical trials in, in those two areas. Okay, and Dr. Ellis? Yes, I, I echo what James says. This is such an important discussion and I'm very grateful to Target Cancer for hosting this webinar and to Mary Pat. I'm also thrilled to be here with Dr. Cleary, who is one of my wonderful mentors and someone I really admire. Um, I'm a clinician researcher at Mass General, so I see patients with cholangiocarcinoma, many on early phase trials of new drugs, and also um, work in a lab on bench to bedside research focused on cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, right. thank you so much. And, you know, just to, uh, you know, level set, because I know we, based on some of the feedback from uh, our participants today, we have a a wide range of familiarity with clinical trials. And so I just wanna start off to make sure that everybody is on the same page when we talk about what is a clinical trial? Um, how does the idea for a clinical trial develop? And, and how does, you know, what, how do you think about, you know, sort of the different phases of a clinical trial um, that a patient who might be considering this option should know about? Um, so I will start with Dr. Ellis. So um, what is a clinical trial? A clinical trial is a, a new way to look at how do we improve treatments for patients. Um, it's, we sort of see sort of trials through the phases of drug developments, everything from phase one, which can sometimes be the first time using these drugs in humans, or oftentimes um, using sort of uh, established drugs in new settings or in new combinations. Um, everything up to phase three trials where we're comparing sort of our new interesting combinations or drugs with our standard of care treatments. Um, clinical trials are absolutely critical for advancing treatment options, particularly in rare cancers, where our standard of care um, often is just insufficient um, in giving us the responses we hope for. Okay, and then I, I want to follow up with Dr. Cleary to see if you have anything to add. And then, you know, also to ask, you know, how does the idea for a clinical trial develop for a specific clinical trial? And what types of approvals are needed to launch a clinical trial? Great question. I, I actually think one of the most important things we do in medicine, especially in the field of oncology, is doing clinical trials to try to get the care better. Um, we, we know we have a long way to go in cancer care. And the only way we're going to get better is to figure out proven strategies that can make our patient outcomes better. But your point, where does it come from? It Really, there's a lot of research going on all over the country. And there's research going on in academic institutions, but also research going on in pharmaceutical companies. And, and this type of research is using cancer cell lines uh, that were very generously donated by patients that we could just work in uh, petri culture dishes to see if certain medicines work. Uh, and also in animal model experiments. And before a drug goes to clinical trials, it's so expensive from a pharmaceutical company's point of view that a ton of research goes in because you really wanna see, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you wanna invest in a trial, you wanna see that there's the highest chance possible that this drug is gonna work. So you wanna see efficacy in cell lines, but even more importantly, you wanna see efficacy in animal models, typically uh, mouse models, of cancer before you make the big and expensive leap into doing clinical trials in patients. So in this way, the um, incentives for the pharma company and the patient are aligned. That the pharma company, they really want the trial to work. And obviously we, as a physician, we want the trials to work for our patients. So I, I really feel like the incentives are in line in that way. And what are some of the criteria that patients need to meet to be accepted into a clinical trial? So um, before a patient goes on, and this is great. So when your doctor starts to talk to you about a clinical trial, they're going to first want to gauge your interest because there's some patients who are very interested in clinical trials or some patients who aren't, and that's okay too. But for patients who are interested in clinical trials, when your doctor identifies a study for you, the first thing he's going to do, he or she, is they're going to talk to you about the study, and we'll do something called informed consent, where they'll give you a, a, a document of papers describing the trials and the type of uh, tests that will happen, and the side effects, and what's in it, what, what are the potential risks, and what are you missing out? Like, could you be getting standard therapies? That informed consent discussion is really important, so you really 
know as much about the trial as possible, what the side effects are and what the alternatives are. After you sign an informed consent, and this gets to your question, then before you start the trial, we just have to make sure you're healthy enough to do the study. So there'll be a screening period where you'll have routine blood tests. And then depending on the trial, cer certain other tests. So some tests have um, toxicity in the retina, so you'll have to undergo an ophthalmological exam. Some tests have, some drugs have toxicity in the heart, and so you'll have to get heart testing. And so really every trial is different, but basically there, there'll be a battery of tests that will be done to make sure you're healthy enough for that study. And then once you're healthy enough for the study, then you can start. Okay. So, you know, now that we've been through that sort of overall introduction, and I just want to remind the audience at any point in time, you know, please feel free to, uh, to ask a question in the chat so that we can integrate it into the discussion here. I want to go back to a point that Kristen made, because this is something that, uh, that I hear all the time, at, you know, that I've heard at different points in my career, um, you know, working in oncology diagnostics and in therapeutics around clinical trials being a last resort. And that means that you've kind of reached the end of your, of your rope. And I just want to go back to Dr. Ellis here. Um, can you comment on that question? How would you answer that question if that was asked to you by a patient? So I would say that's definitely a, a very common question that we hear, but I would say it's definitely a myth that clinical trials have to be a last resort. Uh, the discussion around clinical trials should really be an ongoing discussion with your doctor and your team, because there are sort of different trial options at different points from, you know, <clears throat> front trials to trials after other treatments haven't worked. And, and, and again, sort of echoing a point that we said earlier about Sometimes our standard of care treatments just aren't good enough. And, and for cholangiocarcinoma, for example, our standard of care treatments, the chances of it working are sort of single digit percentages. So we really want to improve on that. And oftentimes, because we're designing these trials based on really strong scientific evidence, we're very optimistic and hopeful that that could be a better option for our patients than the standard of care. You know, I know we're going to be getting into this a little bit later when we start talking about, uh, you know, kind of molecularly guided clinical trials, but the point that you just brought up, I think is so important. Can you talk to how the role of clinical trials has evolved over the past, you know, 10 to 15 years as our understanding of the biology of cancers has improved? So I think something that's really transformed oncology is this concept of precision oncology. So being able to profile tumors to get a better understanding of what sort of molecular changes do we see in tumors. And now in a lot of rare cancers, we have drugs that can target these changes. So it's so critical to be able to one profile tumors and be able to identify biomarkers because now many trials, particularly in rare cancers, are what we call basket studies, where it would be difficult to run a study in in you know, one rare cancer with one rare mutation, but if we look at lots of tumors that have the same mutation to see is this targeted drug effective, that's a really good way to approach it. So I think this precision oncology um, approach has totally changed how trials work. Uh, and Dr. Cleary, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, and, and I, I, first of all, I agree with everything Dr. Ellis said, and, and I'm realizing for for. For the lay audience, it, it is hard to sort of vet clinical trials. And, and I think that's really one of the most intimidating parts of clinical trials. And that's where I, I really think the relationship you have with your oncologist is so important. I, I think you can tell by the way you talk to your oncologist if there's a trial they're very excited about. And, and to be honest, there's, there's so there's some studies that we're just so excited about. And, and if you ask your oncologist, would you do this study? They'll say, absolutely. And they'll say it in a heartbeat. Whereas there's other trials that are much more experimental, have a, a much lower chance of working. And then you'll see your oncologist say, well, maybe in this situation I would, in this situation I wouldn't. So I think really having a, a strong relationship with your oncologist is really important, helping you guide to, to, into which trial you wanna do and whether a study is the right thing for you. The other thing I would say, because I realize people attending this might be from all over the country, I, I really would encourage people out in the community to go see tertiary care medical centers. So um, I have enormous, enormous respect for community oncologists. I, they, they have such a hard job. They're take, I have the luxury of just focusing on gastrointestinal malignancies, whereas community oncologists 
are taking care of glioblastoma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, such a hard job. And so they might not know about all the trials that are going on. Whereas if you can get a referral to go see a tertiary care academic medical center, and really what I'm talking about here is just a, a large cancer center. Um, you can talk to the doctors there and they can talk to you about clinical trials. And I have to say in my practice, I see a lot of patients who are in four or five hours away upstate Maine, and they get all of their care, their chemotherapy in Maine, but about every six months, they come down and see me to talk about other therapeutic options, including clinical trials. And those conversations are very helpful because we, we form a relationship and they can start to see what way I'm thinking about clinical trials. You know, one of the questions that came in from the audience ahead of time, again, sort of adding to this, this myth of, you know, could, could clinical trials potentially be harmful versus helpful? Uh, there's always this uh, question of, am I going to be a guinea pig? Am I going to be robbed of the opportunity to be on a treatment because I'm going to be put on the placebo? Can you comment on that? Is that something that you hear from patients and how would you respond? I think it's such an important question. And again, this is why having a good relationship with your oncology team is important. First, let me say the placebo point is a really important point. Um, fortunately, placebo-controlled trials are rare, but they, we do do them. I really want to say very clearly that if we put you on a placebo-controlled trial, we have to explicitly tell you that and, and really emphasize that. Like, just so you know, you might be getting placebo. So if you enroll in a placebo-controlled trial, you will be told over and over again about that possibility. Um, that's point number one. Point number two is many trials don't have a placebo. Uh, and again, this really gets back to having that relationship with your oncologist or maybe several oncologists where you're talking about trials, gauging their enthusiasm. And it's a very fair question. Would you do this trial? Would you put your mother on this trial? And, and so sometimes, as I said, sometimes I say, yeah, absolutely in a minute. Other times for very experimental trials, I'd say, yeah, in some situations I would, in some situations I wouldn't. And I think that conversation really could help you select whether that trial is for you or not. So, uh, you know, and maybe this is a, uh, to clear up my understanding as well, but I also uh, am, am aware that in many cases, the quote unquote placebo arm, it doesn't mean you're not getting treatment. It means you're getting the standard that you would have been getting anyway with a targeted therapy or something else on top. Is that the case? I mean, I, 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 I think there are some people that, that kind of have this view that there's potentially going to be a withholding of any therapy, but I think from my understanding, it's typically you're getting the standard therapy plus something else if you're on the non-placebo arm of a, of a controlled study. Is that accurate? This is such a great question. You know, the, the answer is it, it depends. And, and again, you, your oncology team really has to talk these details through with you. So in situations where the standard of care is no therapy, and unfortunately that happens in diseases like cholangiocarcinoma, where Really, when, when the FDA says, what's the standard of care for this line of therapy? So cholangial carcinoma has been treated with multiple lines of treatment. The standard of care is really, there is no standard of care. The, the standard of care is best supportive care, no active cancer therapy. So in those cases where someone's been treated with cholangial carcinoma with multiple different regimens, multiple different drugs, and it didn't work, because the standard of care is no treatment, yeah, um, in that case, the placebo control would just be a placebo, a sugar pill. However, more commonly, and this is to your point, it, it's that when we treat a, a first line, so no, a patient with newly diagnosed cholangial carcinoma, and we're trying a new therapy, uh, you might get, you, the, both groups will get the standard of care, gemcitabine and cisplatin chemotherapy. But one group might get gemcitabine, cisplatin, and a new experimental agent, whereas the other group will get just get the standard of care, gemcitabine and cisplatin. So really, to sort of summarize, I think there's two flavors of, of placebo-controlled trials. The most common one is, as you were saying, you're going to get the standard treatment along with a placebo, if that's the way you're randomized, or less commonly, if there's no available treatment for that situation, you could just get a placebo pill. And your oncologist will be explicit and tell you exactly if that's the case. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Ellis. No, I just wanted to highlight a, a nice example of how there's a lot of nuance with placebo-controlled trials. 
And there's a really nice example from cholangiocarcinoma using a targeted therapy in those advanced settings like Dr. Cleary mentioned where multiple other treatments had failed. And with the input of patient advocacy organizations, they designed this trial in such a way that the chances of getting on the active treatment were twice as high. And that if the placebo, you know, if your tumor was growing on placebo, that you could switch over to the active treatment. So just to say that um, there's a lot of options even within placebo controlled trials, again, to try and give patients the, the best therapy possible. Okay. And now, uh, Dr. Ellis, I was going to switch back to you. If you could talk through, you know, just kind of thinking about recent conversations that you've had with your patients about clinical trials, can you talk about how you tend to bring them up and what are the various factors that lead you as a provider um, to recommend or just discuss clinical trials with your patients? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think as, as Dr. Cleary had said earlier, I think first gauging people's interest um, of course, there's a lot of sort of fear and misunderstanding, as we've now highlighted multiple times about it being a last resort. But I do think even from the first visit, particularly with rare cancers, um, I think it's important to bring it up as a potential option. Um, again, because the standard of care, we can always improve on. Um, and particularly if a patient is interested and fit, um, oftentimes a clinical trial can be a really attractive option from, from the start. Um, and I. I really like to explain about, you know, the rationale behind, you know, why I would recommend recommend a clinical trial versus standard of care versus other options. And I think allowing patients to just have a full picture of what their options are um, can probably make it seem less intimidating. Okay. And, you know, so both of you are, uh, you know, of course, affiliated with a large cancer center, um, and there are many clinical trials available. Um, can you talk to the difference between the trials that are run and sponsored by biopharma companies that you may be running at the Farber um, versus those that are run by Dana-Farber itself or by an advocate organization? Super question. Um, so um, the, the, the most common type of trial, let me start there, are what we call industry-sponsored studies. And, and that's when the pharmaceutical company are developing a drug and, and that they will write the protocol, they'll design the trial, um, but academic institutions will participate in enrolling those studies. However, there also are other types of trials. One of them, one of the most powerful types of trials are actually government sponsored trials. So the NIH uh, through the National Cancer uh, Institute has a group of academic centers that work together. One of the biggest groups is called the Alliance where they enroll patients and the power of this approach, we call it cooperative groups, is that we could do trials in rare cancers such as cholangiocarcinoma that we could never do at just one institution and get an answer to that question. And, and the nice thing about these government sponsored trials is they're really vetted very, very carefully through many committees. And they answer a question that might not be profitable for a drug company, but that are important for improving the care of our patients. Similarly, uh, in uh, investigator sponsored trials. Again, this is where a academic investigator has a question and has some data from a laboratory where they're excited that a certain therapy might work and that they run the trial. And again, really what's motivating them is, is this thought that the, the, this therapy could help patients, whereas the profit incentive that's typically involved in industry sponsored studies really isn't there. So there are uh, several different types of studies. Okay. Um, so we've gotten a question from a, a, a listener uh, who's uh, listening from Argentina. I think this is an excellent question that we can tie back to some of the discussion we've had around molecular testing and how that can guide trials. The question is, um, you know, in the situation of clinical trials for pediatric oncology, and I would actually, you know, kind of classify this along with other types of rare tumors, you know, how can we collaborate internationally um, in both basic and translational research. And, and kind of the underlying premise is, similar to rare tumors, there's a lot of information around existing drugs and how those existing drugs may help, you know, other types of tumors. You know, how can we do a better job as a, as a clinical and academic community of comparing information, um, you know, about, you know, drugs and their mechanism, mechanism of action 
with the information that we have about some of these rarer cancers, um, whether they be adult or pediatric cancers. So, so this is a, a really important question. And, and as the, the listener pointed out, cancer is a worldwide disease. It's not just a problem in the United States. And really as a cancer community, we have to do a better job at bringing clinical trials uh, uh, internationally. I will say, we were talking about the different types of trials. Industry-sponsored trials do that. So industry-sponsored trials um, have really the regulatory know-how because that's the challenge. You have to, every com every country has a different regulatory structure that you have to get through to open up a trial and industry really has to know how to do that. So there are several um, international trials that are, that are going on. For, for rare cancer, especially such as something so heartbreaking like DPIG, it, it, it is an issue. And I, I think really, um, Organizations like Target Cancer have started thinking about how to 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 use knowledge that we're we're learning internationally to try to pool our resources because it makes sense, right? For a rare cancer like DPIG, where you're only seeing a small number of cases a year, if we could learn from the cases that are happening worldwide, I think it really would advance the, the level of progress. So I I I really think I would say I, I agree with the issues raised by the listener. I think. It's something that a lot of people in the cancer community are thinking about how we could speed up research in these rare cancers by leveraging the, um, our international colleagues. And, and uh, you know, I think it also speaks to the uh, the importance, you know, when a patient is considering whether or not they want to share the data, um, you know, from their molecular profiling or from their their trial, just understanding how particularly in rare tumors that could, you know, actually help patients that that come after them, um, which is which is extremely powerful. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, just, you know, kind of getting back to sort of the basic conversations that a that a patient needs to be having with their physician? How can a patient, especially one who's seen outside of an academic center, address clinical trials with their physician if that's not proactively brought up? Um, Dr. Ellis, do you want to take a first stab at that one? Yeah, so I, I think this really gets to the point of having that strong relationship with your oncology team to be able to feel comfortable asking these types of questions. Mm -hmm. And I do think um, asking for second opinions, particularly when you have a rare tumor, is really important to be seen at an academic center that sees a lot of just that type of tumor and has access to many trials. I would not feel um, nervous or afraid of asking your team to seek a second opinion. Um, at the end of the day, we're all in this to help people and, and get them access to the best treatments possible. So I think sometimes it does require a little bit of advocacy from yourself or your caregiver team, but your oncology team should really be open and receptive to, to you seeking other opinions. And uh, you hit on a point that I know I've I've heard uh, you know a lot is that people are fearful of insulting their doctor. Um, you know, I, understanding both of you are at academic centers, so maybe in a slightly different position, can you maybe take that uh, take the perspective of a doctor who's who's treating a patient? I mean, do you think that it's insulting for a patient to bring something like this up? Not at all. I think we all um, in the oncology community, particularly in rare cancers, really welcome having other opinions because there's so much expertise to go around and sort of like the the viewer was saying that I think collaborating and and meeting of the minds is so important to help make the best decisions. So I think, you know, from the from the care provider side, we are there's no insulting whatsoever and we actually welcome it and we encourage it. Even for our patients who perhaps we don't have a trial available in Boston, but they have something in New York. Mm -hmm. um, it's just about making sure the patient gets the right therapy for them at the right time. And, and that's an important point as well. So if there's not a trial available in a, in a, you know, where a patient lives or in their area, even if they are near a, an academic center, are there tools that are available for them to find clinical trials at a specific institution or, you know, even, you know, anywhere in the country um, that you can speak to? Yeah, so it's a good question. I, I um, there are some tools. I, I feel like we could do better. Clinicaltrials.gov is, is a um, 
database that's maintained by the National Cancer Institute that has all the active trials on it. Um, the issue with clinicaltrials.gov is, is just kind of, there's a lot of information there and just kind of going through all the studies can be a little intimidating. You know, especially with the dawn of, of molecular profiling, um, a lot of molecular profiling reports um, from places like Tempest and Foundation Medicine, they'll actually have clinical trials listed for that alteration. So the report can be helpful. But again, I, I think talking to your oncologist is probably the best resource. They can help vet which trials they think are exciting and which trials they don't think are exciting. And, and oftentimes they'll know people at other institutions. So you might just, I, I had to write to someone from Memorial Sloan Kettering the other day and we do that all the time. So talking to your oncologist, asking him, and, and I think from a patient point of view, thinking about which city would practically make sense for you. Um, the example I often give is, is my mother-in-law ha had lung cancer. And, and so she lived in Dallas. And the only two cities we were considering for her were Dallas and Boston, because we lived here. And so even if there would have been a trial at a, a great place, say UCSF in San Francisco, we weren't going to send her there because she didn't know anyone out there. We just didn't think that was practical. So I think what can help you um, shrink your search is just thinking about which cities you think uh, you could be treated in. You know, I also want to point out, you know, that this is uh, a webinar sponsored by the Target Cancer Foundation. I can't emphasize enough the importance of a resource like a an advocacy group that focuses particularly on rare tumors or on an organization like NORD, which is the National Organization of Rare Diseases. Um, patient advocate groups are well aware um, of, the, of the lack of information as well as the importance of clinical trial options for patients. So, you know, always view advocate groups either as a source of directly finding out about trials or at least, you know, how to point you in the right direction or how to uh, speak with your physician about that. Um, so, so, you know, we've been talking about clinical trials that may be available, you know, in different locations, and I'll turn back to Dr. Ellis here. Um, can you speak to the cost uh, of a patient participating in, trial, in a trial? Um, what might their financial obligations be? And if you do find that you need to travel um, to, you know, to a different center or to a different city, um, to participate in a trial, you know, is there any availability of funding uh, for, uh, you know, for, for patients who choose to do that? Yes, no, it's, it's such a good point. So on clinical trials, you know, at both of our institutes and, and many other institutes around the country, there are whole teams of people that help set up all these different resources for patients to have access to these trials. Um, so one of the first things that's done is just making sure that your insurance covers that. In general, clinical trials, pieces of the trial that are routine care, so blood work, some doctor's visits, some scans that you would get if you were on a trial or not, get billed to your insurance as normal, whereas other pieces that are more done for the research aspect or the drug, which is often the most expensive piece, is covered by the sponsor of the trial. Um, in terms of sort of what resources available, oftentimes clinical trials will have sort of travel budgets and accommodation budgets available for to sort of offset some of the costs of traveling from the community into an academic center. And the clinical trial teams would have would be able to answer all those questions specifically for each trial. But in in general, it shouldn't be a significant financial burden um, different than your sort of routine oncologic care. Okay. And, uh, you know, can you talk about, um, you know, again, so if a patient does choose to travel for a clinical trial, does that mean that all of their care needs to be done at that center where they're traveling? Great question. So, um, I can give an example for, for a patient who lives uh, five hours away, um, very northern Maine. For the large part, yes. So um, while you're on the clinical trial um, here in Boston, they're going to have to get the majority of their care here. And, and unfortunately, the, the way the trials are written, there's some tests that have to be done at, at the clinical trial center. However, knowing that a patient lives very far away, anytime there's routine care. So for example, uh, if the patient comes and gets treated every three weeks, but 
uh, in between treatments, they get sick and they have to be hospitalized for a urinary tract infection. I'm going to partner with a local oncologist to get the patient in the hospital locally to take care of that. And, and that kind of speaks, Haley was talking about this before, but I actually feel like it's, it's, it's a team effort. And, and the, the local oncologist, even if they're not participating in the trial, they're so important and they could help us take care of these things that come up on trials where patients get sick and might have to get hospitalized locally, but also just communicating back and forth about what's going on with the patient about whether or not they should go on the trial. So, but to answer the question, by and large, most of the treatment will happen at the cancer center that are doing the trial, but things like supportive care and emergencies that get come up can be done locally. And I think that raises the point to another common question that I've heard is, you know, am I losing my primary oncology team? And I think to what Dr. Cleary was saying, the answer is no, we want to work together to provide you the highest and best quality care possible. So it, it actually becomes an even bigger team. And and your 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 original oncology team will always be your team. That's great. Uh, so another question, and this centers around molecular testing. We've talked about the importance of molecular testing, particular for, particularly for patients with rare tumors, um, to enroll in a clinical trial. Can you also speak to other benefits of getting molecular testing for patients with rare tumor types? So I, I think, I, as you said, I think it does help in selecting trials. It, it gives prognostic information too. Um, so some uh, molecular alterations can tell you if you have a very aggressive cancer and your prognosis might be a little shorter, or might show it's an indolent cancer and your progress pro uh, prognosis might be uh, greater. And, and the other thing that's coming into play, especially with some liquid biopsies, it's not quite there yet, but in some patients who undergo a curative surgery, we, we have the decision to make about whether we give additional chemotherapy after a surgery done with curative intent to try to keep this cancer from coming back. And right now, we typically will just give the chemotherapy, but we're hoping in the future that we could use a liquid biopsy to see if the patient even needs that uh, chemotherapy. So I, I think molecular diagnostics are getting more and more sophisticated and are impacting the way we care for our patients in many, many different ways. And I think another role of what I would call serial tumor profiling, whether that's by biopsies throughout treatment or liquid biopsies, is helping us get a sense of what's happening in the tumor on a specific treatment, which tells us about, you know, how these drugs work, how tumors figure out a way to grow around these drugs so that we can design better drugs in the future. And it also helps us think about what's the next best treatment after this one. So having that dynamic information is very helpful um, to help us make the best decision for, for patients. Okay. And, Particularly you know, as we get more therapies in certain spaces and we're having the luxury of having to decide between multiple treatments. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Ellis and, and she's actually a leader in that field. And sorry, Mary Pat, this is such a great question because I, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the other thing we're learning about in oncology is that we're able to pick up if families are at risk for cancer with something called germline DNA testing, where basically we just do a blood test and it could be on a cancer patient, non-cancer patient. And we see if there's a gene that is predisposing this person to get cancer. That is such important information. A, because sometimes we actually change the way we treat those cancers. So if you have something called a BRCA mutation, we might give you a, a drug called a PARP inhibitor, but also it gives the family important information that perhaps the other siblings are at higher risk for a particular cancer. So um, there's lots of different types of molecular testing that can do lots of different things. Um, and uh, you can tell Dr. Ellis and I are big fans of it. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I also just want to point any listeners, if you're interested in more information around genetic and genomic testing and the difference between those two, the previous webinar that was hosted by Target Fan Cancer Foundation was hosted exactly on this topic and why you might consider getting genetic or genomic testing, um, which also uh, leads me to the question, you know, both genetic and genomic testing, one of the reasons that we uh, have been able to make so much progress over the past, you know, particularly two decades is because we're generating an enormous amount of data, both about the biology of tumors, as well as understanding how people with different profiles respond to certain therapies. Um, you know, I'll start with you, Dr. Cleary, since you're on my screen. Uh, you know, 
What can you talk to talk to us about what happens to the data and personal information um, for a person who is participating on a trial? And does the patient actually get to access that data? Great question. So um, there's actually two parts to this. There's one. So when you enroll in a clinical trial, um, you will in the consent form, they'll talk about some biological specimens, blood or maybe even a, a tumor biopsy that they'll collect from you and that they'll do genetic analysis, but they'll tell you about this. Um, oftentimes uh, um, on these clinical trials, because we're just, we don't know what the information means yet. And so we're trying to understand it from a scientific level. So because we're still trying to understand this, that genomic information does not get returned to the patient. Um, however, it's important to talk about that because if there are any, sometimes they'll say as part of this trial, we're going to do serial liquid biopsies and they'll give you the report. So that's great. So I, I would just talk to your oncologist about that, but oftentimes the results aren't returned to the patients, but sometimes they are. The other thing I just wanted to say, and this is something Target Cancer ha has been a leader in, they, they funded a research project that I was involved in, in cholangial carcinoma. And, and this was really just done by some very, very generous patients who signed a um, consent form saying that we could collect their blood and tumor specimens to do research on. And so really there was a, no benefit to the patient at all. It really was just a tissue collection um, consent form that let us build this big biobank where we could work with scientists to try to advance the field of cholangial carcinoma. And uh, as a result of these very generous patients and also the funding from Target Cancer, we were able to find that an abnormality in cholangial carcinoma that we didn't know about before that benefits from a certain drug. And we publish that information, now people worldwide can get it. And, and so those tissue collection protocols where people um, are able to collect your biological samples and do research are just incredibly helpful. Thank you. So we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I wanted to, you know, first of all, just ask both Dr. Cleary and Dr. Ellis, is there anything that comes up for you all the time, you know, common myths about clinical trials that we have not yet covered? Um, or anything else that you know you think is important for the audience to know. And then I want to turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, maybe one thing that I'll bring up is that I think sometimes there's a lot of fear around sort of we discussed this in that being a guinea pig, but that there's a lot of risk involved with being on a trial. And sometimes it is very experimental and we're using these drugs for the first time in people. But I would say in general, there are so many layers of being watched on a clinical trial from the research nurses to the coordinators, to the nurses, to the oncologists, that you're watched probably even closer to really ensure your safety um, at all times. So I think that that's an important message to hear that it is experimental sometimes, but we, we do prioritize patient safety above all. I agree with Dr. Ellis and, and really, uh, to emphasize the point you made before, Mary Pat, that it, it, it's it's not a last resort, and really just emphasizing that these trials might even um, have more potential to do good than the standard therapy. Thank you. That I want to open to the audience to see if there are any additional questions. And if not, uh, I just want to wrap up by, you know, again, thanking Target Cancer Foundation for sponsoring uh, this webinar. This is an extremely important topic. Um, you know, something that, uh, you know, I, I, I have encountered uh, several times within my career. And just a reminder that, you know, the therapies that are available today um, are available because patients have donated their time um, and their, uh, you know, their tissue. Um, you know, to testing these therapies when they were available in clinical trials. Um, so, you know, as, as, you know, both Dr. Cleary and Dr. Ellis have been saying, you know, not only can a clinical trial potentially provide access to better therapy, um, but there's also the opportunity to really benefit the broader patient community. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Cleary and Dr. Ellis so much for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, and, and I know that this has been helpful for so many uh, on the call today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Thank you so much. Really important topic.